So do you remember that one time that you had a pair of jacks post-flop and you were like, this is a really easy hand to play? Yeah, me neither. So let's review one of these spots where I completely tanked a pair of jacks and talk about what the heck went wrong and see what the solver might do in this kind of spot. Good morning, how are we doing today? My name is James Sweeney, aka Split Suit. Welcome back to another video. And today I want to review a hand from vlog episode number six, where I made a massive mistake with a pair of jacks. So let's fire it up. So playing one, two down in Orange City, look down at jack nine suited in the hijack. Folds around to me, open to six, and at some tables, six gets the job done. At others, it's not going to do anything, but this was the one where I thought six was either going to get a heads up pot or a no way pot most of the time. End up getting called by the small blind. So heads up to a flop of ace, queen, jack. They check over to us and I fire for 10. So even though this is kind of a mundane situation, just a basic small pot, small c back kind of deal, I think it's worth taking a moment to run this through a solver. So let's use GTO Plus real quick. So I already went in and plugged in the ranges, set up the game tree, and here we are. And there's a couple things I want to note right off the bat. First and foremost, the solver likes our opponent checking pretty much all the time. What do we see? 99.9% .9 of the time, the solver prefers a check, so that's always good to know. And then once they check what are our options here and we look here and you notice that the solver really likes checking this behind a pretty good chunk of the time about 43 percent of the time it wants to check the rest is going to be bets and i split it between a larger size bet and a smaller size bet and if we hover over our jack nine specifically we notice that with our jack nine of spades the solver likes this to be checked 100 percent of the time which is a little bit different than the fact that I decided to bet in this situation. So clearly this continuation bet is not GTO solver approved by any stretch of the imagination, but what I might think for a moment is, okay, well, we're playing 1-2 live, and we're playing against humans, so no one's going to be playing GTO perfect by any stretch of the imagination. So I say, okay, well, what does the solver say my opponent should do when facing a bet? And then I can start saying, okay, if my opponent is likely going to deviate from that solver suggestion, could I throw more bluffs into my betting range or maybe even bets like this, which is not really a bluff. It's definitely not really for value. It's not really doing a tremendous amount on the surface. But if my opponent is deviating massively one way or the other, either right this moment or say they're going to call too wide here and then fold too often later, that could be a great situation where I just turn this into just bluff city because maybe they're going to overfold ace x later or queen x later whatever it is so that's one thing that i like to do when i'm taking this time off table to explore through a solver but one of the ways you can do that is to go over here and say okay let's just say that we decide to fire like we did what does the solver think our opponent should be doing here and notice that it has them raising about seven percent of the time calling about 40 percent and folding a little above 50 percent so one of the things I like to do is just look at the raising stuff and say, you know, is my opponent likely to be raising like this? And if you hover over it and kind of look at the combos, you'll notice that there's definitely the clubs being prioritized amongst these combos that are suited. Okay. And then also look at the call and see if there's anything in there that makes sense. And then also fold. So one of the things I'm looking for in the fold is what does the solver think they should do with like bottom pair, second pair, and top pair? So you notice there's actually a decent chunk of folding going on from the weaker ace x hands well i don't assume most of my opponents are going to fold a tremendous amount of those combos so that's one way that they are deviating from the solver and the solver suggesting that they fold kind of the weaker queen x hands like queen 10 suited queen 9 suited queen 10 off all that kind of stuff and again i don't think my opponents are going to be doing that in the real world which is really important to note because chances are a lot of these hands that the solver is suggesting our opponent actually fold are hands our opponent are probably going to end up throwing into their check call range, which means there are more combos in there that might possibly make mistakes later against a double barrel or a triple barrel plan, something like that, or maybe they're just never going to fold. Maybe they're going to get really, really sticky with ace X or queen X out of hands. You really have to make that decision right this moment if you're going to start deviating from the solver. Why am I modifying? what the solver says I should do with jack nine and is that going to make sense based upon the way my opponent is likely going to deviate from what the solver suggests they should actually do which means going back to the original point of the fact that we are playing one two against a normal one two live cash player 
probably going to be continuing with all of those ace-x combos for a check call, at least for one, and probably the queen-x combo just the same, especially ones that have any sort of gut shot material with them, like king-queen or queen-10, and probably same thing, honestly, with like jack-10 as well. So they're probably going to continue a lot more right this moment, so unless you think you can barrel them off, and again, against your average 1-2 opponent, that could be tough to get them to ever fold something like top pair. This could be a really tricky situation, and probably one where deviating from the solver isn't going to be all that good. I think checking here is going to be far better. And just to be very, very clear, we're not saying just check broadly because you have a weak pair right? Because the solver will find plenty of situations where it's totally fine c-betting the flop with a bottom pair. It's not a broad strokes based upon that thought process. I know a lot of players will jump to that conclusion looking at this solver data, but this is not the way you want to look at it. Because again, you can find plenty of situations where the solver really likes betting with bottom pair even on the flop. So with all that being said, before we continue on to the next street, I want to take a moment and look at what the solver says we should be doing if we decide to take its advice and actually check behind on the flop instead. So when we check behind on the flop, we notice that the solver still likes our opponent checking the turn a pretty good chunk of the time on a three of diamonds. But when they do decide to fire, whether they fire for 14, so pot size, or they fire for 7, you notice that they still like folding our jack 9 against that number. And if we go back a tick, look at betting half pot, the solver still likes us folding with our jack 9. So the plan here is actually, and let's just say they check as well, just so we can have a full idea on what we should be doing here. It still likes checking 100% of our jack nine behind as well. So the solver is very much on board with taking the approach of check the flop behind and then also check that turn behind and then go forward from there. And if you face pressure on the turn, just fold it, let it go, and be done with it. All right, so I think we've beat this street to death by this point. Let's get moving on. Again, I'm not in love with the C-bet, and neither is the solver. So we fire, get called pretty darn quickly by the small blind. Turn is the three of diamonds as we just went over. They check, I check behind. River is the seven of diamonds. They decide to fire out 425. And I let this one go. So facing that $25 bet on the river, I really don't see much else I can do. We could consider going for a raise, I suppose, but I don't think it looks particularly real after checking that turn behind. And calling doesn't really make a tremendous amount of sense either. I mean, we're hoping that they have like busted clubs or busted 10-9 kind of stuff. I block the 9 to an extent, so uh, I don't know. I, I don't really think we can justify a hero call uh, raise. Again, I don't think it makes a tremendous amount of sense. This opponent is thinking i think they might easily honestly snap it off just because the no turn bet doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense for me having a really valuable hand especially on such a draw heavy board even on that brick turn card so i really don't see much other reason to do anything other than just simply fold against that river bet so all of this kind of culminates to this one point in idea based upon the conversation we've had so far and the solver work that we've done is in this situation, we kind of have two overall lines we can take. We can take the solver approved line, which is to check the flop behind and play it very, very protective and smart going into turns and rivers. Or we can fire the flop, deviate from the GTO solver, but it has to be with a plan. So if the plan is to bet flop check turn play rivers like this is really not going to be a winning proposition it looks like because you really can't handle turn or river pressure after your flop c back gets called you really are in a situation where you're pretty much forced to turn your bottom pair into a bluff and barrel and then the question is it going to be two barrels or three barrels and is your opponent really going to fold enough top pair because if they're going to fold top pair i mean great by all means just see about everything and just continue barreling off and just expect to absolutely print money on turns and or rivers However, if you don't have that information, then this line I don't think makes any sense. Just check the flop behind, go forward, make decisions. It's going to be much, much easier and also more profitable at the end of the day. So even though we're talking about a loss of a $10 C-bet, and it may not seem like a lot, for a lot of 1-2 players, that's going to be their hourly rate. So if you are able to recoup this and not just continue make the, making this kind of blunder, especially for people who are just auto C-betting everything and not really thinking too, too much about it, hopefully this convinces you to think about situations situations like this a little bit more deeply. Again, I'm not saying just adhere blindly to what the solver is saying, but understanding what the solver is suggesting, why it's making that suggestion, and where and how you might deviate from that, and if that deviation is going to be any good. 
And if it is, make sure you follow through with the plan rather than bed flop check turn behind where it's probably not going to do what you want it to do. So hopefully that makes sense. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to leave a comment down below. And by the way, if you like this solver, want to learn how to use it at a very, very deep level, I highly suggest checking out the GTO Plus bundle from Red Chip Poker. Leave a link for that in the description box. It comes with the solver lifetime license for a Windows machine. Excellent, excellent post-flop solver and an entire training course teaching you exactly how to use it. Again, link in the description box if you're interested. That is the GTO Plus bundle from Red Chip Poker. And as always, always thank you so much for hanging out today if you need anything at all please don't hesitate to let me know and of course a thumbs up on the video if you enjoyed it would be massively appreciated otherwise i'll see you back shortly with a brand new video in the meantime good luck out there and happy grinding